Welcome everybody to this uh, second session now of the Peace Research Colloquium. Uh, my name is Donna Landau. I'm a senior researcher at the Swiss Peace, the Swiss Peace Foundation, and which is also an associated institute of the University of Basel. I was just going to say the house rules, please put yourself on mute if possible. Um, so quickly about the colloquium, this is co-hosted by Swiss Peace, uh, the Institute for Political Science at the University of Basel at the Graduate School of Social Sciences, 3GS. So now it's really a great um, honor and pleasure to welcome Annika Birkdahl, um, who many of you have probably seen her name in the many readings of peace and conflict studies that you've done. Um, Annika Birkdahl is a professor of political science at Lund University in Sweden, where she's speaking to us from today. And she has um, a wide research agenda and published widely on various themes, including international and local peace building and the relationships uh, between them, the focus particularly on urban peace building, as well as on issues of gender and transitional justice. And among her recent publications are books such as Peace Building and the Spatial Transformation, um, Peace, Space and Place, as well as volumes on Spatializing Peace and Conflict, um, Peace Building and Friction, Global Local Encounters, and Divided Cities. Uh, so she will speak today about this topic of the spatial turn and in peace and conflict studies. And we have with us Klaas Kedaikema as a discussant. Um, she's a senior researcher also at Swiss Peace and a Marie Curie postdoctoral fellow. Um, her research centers on urban peace building and geographies of peace. And she's particularly interested in peace building agency of marginalized civilian actors. She has conducted her PhD research on social housing neighborhoods in France that deal with urban violence. So, so much for me just as introduction. Um, Professor Bergdahl, the floor is yours. Thank you. And thank you for this really nice introduction. Uh, I'm very happy to, to be here. I mean, to be in this Zoom seminar and take part in the research colloquium and for this opportunity to uh, present to you some of the research findings uh, from our research agenda on the spatial turn in peace and conflict. Uh, and I think uh, to just set you off, uh, I think that the spatial turn in peace and conflict is a response to a cri de coeur that some peace geographers actually uh, made a couple of years back that there is a need to investigate more closely the interconnectedness between space and place on the one hand and peace and conflict on the other hand. And we have as political scientists and peace and conflict researchers taken this task to heart and we have tried to engage with the works of geographers uh, to inspire our research on peace and conflict. And what I think that this uh, spatial turn actually does is that it helps to help us to rethink some of the relationships uh, when it comes to understanding where peace and conflict take place. So it's about emplacing peace and conflict in a way um, that I think is really interesting. Um, and I think that we haven't paid enough attention to, to space and place in peace and conflict. And I think that spatial perspectives and spatial, spatial analysis they can provide new and important insights, both to the dynamics of conflicts, but also to the processes of peace. So there is a lot of new information and the knowledge and insights that can be produced by, you know, engaging more with geographers and their work on peace. Uh, and I think that we as peace and conflict researchers and political scientists, we have not really um, I would say, engage sufficiently with the analytical concepts of geography and spatial theory to see what they can help us, what they can help us analyze in terms of peace building, where peace take place, peace building agency, and so forth. So I think there is uh, much more work to be done, and we are just at the beginning of this. In the talk, I, I will try to talk about theory and theoretical concepts, but I will also um, show you and present some empirical vignettes of spatial, al spatial analysis uh, based on research I've conducted with some of my famous colleagues and good friends, such as Susan Buckley-Sistel at Marlborough University, um, Stephanie Kapler at Durham University, and uh, Johanna Managen-Selimovic 
at Södertörn University. And we have for a couple of years now uh, tried to consolidate this research agenda. And I have picked um, some diagnostic sites um, based on the research that we have done. Uh, and when we talk about uh, peace building and spatial transformation, I would like us to look a little bit at the Sarajevo Roses and the Nicosia Buffer Zone to look at placemaking and space making. And um, I also want to look at um, agonistic peace building. And we do have done that through Hannah Arendt's concept, space of appearance. And we have in place that space of appearance on the bridge across the river Drina in Visegrad. So that would be one of the diagnostic sites. Uh, and the final site, which could perhaps not be called a site, but we use it as such. And that is uh, the Republika Serbska, the um, Serb Republic of Bosnia and Herzegovina, where, we, where I've looked at the spatialization of state becoming. So those are sort of the empirical illustrations that I will try to use to give flavor to, to some of the theoretical reasoning. But I think I wanna start with saying, what does the spatial turn signify? Just very briefly. I'm sure that, um, that most of you uh, have an idea and think it is important, I guess, otherwise you wouldn't be attending this seminar. Um, but I think it, it does a lot of things, this spatial turn. It helps situate spatial analysis of peace and conflict in the history of turns. And here we have uh, Edward Soyas, uh, postmodern geographer, geographies, um, which sort of demonstrated the shift to consider social relations as spatial situatedness. We also have the work by Lefebvre and uh, Massey uh, that has been very inspiring for the spatial turn. And I think also that the spatial turn uh, helps spatializing peace and conflict, make visible the, the spatial aspects of peace and conflict. Um, and also show that the organization of space is significant for the structure and function of peace and war. And to me, it helps raise intriguing questions such as where does peace take place? So the spatial turn, I guess, is about these things. And to me, it is significant. Um, but let me start with our own research uh, on peace building and spatial transformation. Because what has intrigued me uh, is to what extent a warscape can be transformed into a peace escape? What signifies a, a warscape and a peace escape? And how are material and immaterial legacies of conflict transformed into places and spaces of, of peace? What are the peace building agencies that can engage in space making and place making and transforming the legacy of conflict into uh, peace and sites of peace for the future? And of course, agency becomes really crucial here in, in both in critical peace building research, but also in our uh, take on the spatial turn in peace and conflict studies. Um, and we read agency through the processes of space making and place making. And of course, through spatial practices and how social activities and political activities are spatialized. And here we're using concepts that come with a lot of um, theoretical weight. Uh, and I think there is a lot to do about unpacking these uh, concepts, and we're still in the beginning of doing this, at least as peace and conflict researchers. Let me quickly take you to our first diagnostic site, and that is Sarajevo and the legacy of um, of the thousand days of siege of Sarajevo between 1992 and 1995. And this is a site that I think very well demonstrates peace building as space making. Because we want to understand how this violent legacy can be transformed into a, help, a tool for peace building and help peace. And what you see here on, on this picture is 
actually the Sarajevo roses or something that is called the Sarajevo roses. And these are the patched traces of grenade explosions in the ground during the siege of Sarajevo. And they are historic markers of violence of the exact place where the shell exploded. So it's the emplaced legacy of the Bosnian war in the cityscape. But now these scars of shells are filled with red color to mark the blood of the victims. And they have become a permanent mark of collective memory in the cityscape or in the memoryscape of, of Sarajevo. And I think this is, or we read it as an effort at space making to transform a place of violence into a place of commemoration. And our analysis of the Sarajevo roses sort of indicate that this is a testimony of the everyday experiences of the Sarajevans during the war. It's a legacy of the conflict that has transformed into roses to remember the victims of the past. And to some extent, it is actually a people's monument. It's an urban memory monument. Uh, and I think it speaks to a lot of people because it is silent about the identity of the victims and it's also silent about the perpetrators. So it's a, it is a, a monument that speaks to, to a larger audience. And it is a collective memory, it's an abstraction, it is a space. So in a sense, it is about space making, turning a place into a space. Because when we think about, which is of course a pretty banal uh, distinction between place and space, but we think of place as material, as having physicality, um, as uh, helping distinguish between who is in place and who is out of place. Uh, and it has some kind of materiality to it. So space making it that then is about turning a place into a space. It's the process of making a physical place relevant and meaningful to social and political discourses. And it's the enactment, use and interpretation of place um, and turns it into a space that is meaningful to the users and the observers. So space making is a form of peace building in this sense. Um, and it takes as the point of departure this physical place and through meaning making processes transforms it into an abstract ideational social space, uh, a space of commemoration of collective memory in this case of the Sarajevo roses. Uh, and this sort of is, a, I, we think at least, a, a good illustration of what we, how we interpret space making and an empirical illustration of our theorization of space making as peace building. And I'll see if you, if you think it's a good illustration as well eventually during the discussion. The next site um, that I wanna take you to uh, is the Nicosia buffer zone which we have used to illustrate the peace building process of placemaking. Um, the Nicosia buffer zone runs um, through the capital of Nicosia, uh, but it also runs across the entire island of Cyprus, creating a divided island. Uh, and it puts in place two parallel ethnoscapes on each side of the, bus, uh, of the buffer zone. One is the Greek Cypriot ethnoscape, and then we have the Turk Cypriot ethnoscapes, if you want to term them ethnoscapes or not. And the buffer zone is this militarized zone in the middle, marked by the scars of confrontation and guarded by UN peacekeepers. So this is clearly a very militarized place, uh, the buffer zone. And to some, it's an empty void. Yanis Papadakis, for example, has referred to it as the dead zone. And for a long time, it was non-accessible to the people of Cyprus. Uh, there were no housing uh, in the buffer zone, apart from this small mixed village of Pila. But otherwise, you know, it wasn't accessible uh, at all. Uh, 
Uh, but eventually, over time, it has opened up. Um, the crossing at Ledra Palace was opened up in 2003, which sort of eased the tension uh, and increased mobility, of course, and slowly but surely did also uh, result in the opening of other crossings, such as the one at Ledra Street, which managed to reconnect the two shopping streets of Nicosia, so improving um, uh, mobility of the city. But what I think is particularly interesting with this empty space uh, or the void or the dead zone is how it has been transformed by the bicommunal movement. Um, because the, the idea of the bicommunal peacemaking has guided much of the grassroots um, peacemaking or peace building processes in, in Cyprus. And here, when we talk about um, the Nicosia buffer zone and placemaking, it's about making place for the idea of peace in the buffer zone. And in that sense, transforming this militarized place into uh, a place for peace. And first of all, we have the Ledra Palace Hotel, which has been very thoroughly investigated and researched by um, uh, Olga, uh, I forgot her name. Olga Dimitrio, uh, and then we also have the House for Cooperation, which have managed to house this idea of peace, the bicommunal idea of peace. So to some extent, this uh, placemaking has been an appropriation of place, of the buffer zone, and transformed it into something else. It gave new meaning to the dead zone, and some would even say that it has meant the resurrection of the dead zone at least parts of it. Um, and that has been one of the things that we investigated. So we have two parallel processes here. We have the process of uh, space making and then the process of place making. Uh, and place making in contrast to space making, here we depart from space, from an ideational concept or something imaginary. And through the place making process, we can read agency through this process, uh, spaces are, are uh, turned into a place. And here it is the bicommunal idea of, of peace that has been emplaced in the House for Cooperation. So agents have been able to give physical presence to an ideational space. Um, and clearly places are made as people ascribe qualities to the material and to the social. And then the question that we are left with then, can the buffer zone in Cyprus make place for peace? And we've seen other agents, marginalized peace building agents, such as Occupy the Buffer Zone movement that also made efforts to transform this place into something else. So we have tried to look at peace building through the processes of space making and place making. And of course, agency, peace building agency has been key to our investigation. And we have looked mainly at local um, grassroots peace building agency, often marginalized in the more elite centered peace processes. And to read peace building agency through space making and place making endeavors is one way we think to investigate the interconnectedness between peace and space and place. And I'll see if you, if you find this a, a useful way as well. And of course, we are careful in thinking that agency is not only about driving change, but there is agency to perpetuate status, status quo as well. So agency is not necessarily connected with change all the time, uh, but it has been key to our investigation here in, in thinking about transformation of spaces and places. And I have to move quickly to take you to all the di diagnostic sites that we have investigated. So the next site I want to uh, take you to, uh, which changes our theoretical approach a bit here, because this is where we use Hannah Arendt's concept of space of appearance. And the diagnostic sites that we have investigated is the bridge across the River Drina in Visegrad, in Eastern Bosnia, in Republic of Srpska. 
And we think of this space of appearance as in relation to commemoration. And this bridge is one out of three bridges that we investigated in looking at peace building agency. Um, but I decided to just focus on one of the bridges. Um, and this is it. Um, what we've done here is to try to explore how this material place of the bridge interplays with social spaces and in the process producing agency. And we have particularly looked at the bridge in, in the month of May, which is the big commemoration month in Bosnia Herzegovina. And we've seen how a space of appearance has emerged when uh, victims of the conflict and relatives of the victims come together every last Sunday in May since the end of the war to commemorate the victims of Visegrad and throwing into the river 3,000 roses. And this is a gathering of Bosniaks returning to Visegrad, where most of them have left since the war. Um, and they come together and demonstrate their presence as they remember the past. And this spatial practice of coming together every year can be understood as a demonstration of agency of otherwise marginalized uh, groups in this particular space. And it's about taking this place in position. And it's also one day where some of the major silences in Visegrad are challenged. And what we find particularly interesting is this interplay between the material place and the social space, which of course can be read in different ways. But we have read it sort of along these lines, that the Bosniak that participate in the ceremony on the bridge, for them, the bridge symbolizes pain, suffering, as well as a quest for justice. And its narrative stresses Bosniaks as victims of ethnic cleansing. So in that sense, Visegrad is you know, a space emptied of, of uh, Bosniaks. But on the other hand, the majority of the Bosnian Serbs of Visegrad, they meet the ceremony with silence. And doing fieldwork there during the commemoration, you can sit on a cafe at one of, of the sides of, of the bridge and there will be music blasting out from the loudspeakers and you know everyday life is continuing as nothing happens on the bridge so i think this is also a strategy of silence uh, a strategy to silence these voices that are taking the bridge uh, appropriate the bridge and take it, take it in position so there are different narratives that are projected onto, onto the bridge at different times. And we found that space of appearance, this concept by Hannah Arendt was exceptionally well suited to our investigation. Because here we could see people come together and speech in and in action. And they are performing a collective agency as a spatial practice. And this, common um, visibility of the actors, it actually produces power. And I think it also very well demonstrates contestation of peace, that peace building is agonistic uh, and it's a process of conflicting narratives. And these conflicting narratives are projected onto the material surface of the bridge, particular uh, the last Sunday of May every year, where this becomes a place of commemoration. So trying to connect the dots of spaces of appearance here is that spaces of appearance at certain places at certain times are sites for spaces of appearance um, that can be read as some kind of agonistic peace building. But it also shows that uh, space of appearance are highly fragile and it's an elusive aspect of agency, even though it's collective agency, it comes and goes and it's fluid and it passes quickly. I think the spaces of appearance as a concept is able to capture the mutual constitution of material place and social space. Um, and um, it also helps in our readings of where peace take place. And it demonstrates 
to us at least, that peace building unfolds in place specific forms and combinations. Uh, and it helps connect peace, if we want to talk about pieces in plural, to place, and that different places can hold different types of, of pieces, revealing some, some of the agonism in peace building. And I think uh, I will now continue to, to the final site of my uh, empirical investigation, uh, the final empirical illustration, and that is um, uh, Republika Srpska, spatializing the imagined state of Republika Srpska. And this is sort of a way to analyze uh, space state becoming through spatialization as one of the tools of making visible an imagined state. And I think what is interesting here is that both war making and peacemaking is about reorganizing space. War making is of course the violent reorganization of space, but also peacemaking is about reorganization of space. And it was through the Dayton Peace Accord um, that the Republic of Serbska was established as an autonomous entity within Bosnia and Herzegovina. And to some extent it was a partial recognition and legitimization of the war gains, war gains by the Bosnian Serbs. And it also created the inter-entity boundary line, um, which is of course an ad, was an administrative a demarcation, not controlled by police or military or anything, but it was still a border. And I've used spatialization as one way of understanding state becoming. It has helped me to emplace the imaginaries and performances of the state. Uh, and I think that spatialization of the becoming of the state tend to include certain elements, such as the territorial control and violent reorganization of space, erasing the memory and materiality of the presence of the other. So it's also you know, shown the ethnic cleansing. Um, it has demonstrated population exchanges and who belongs to place and who is who is inside, who is in and who is out of place. Uh, and spatialization also helps us focus on boundaries and borders uh, as the inter-entity boundary line did. Uh, and spatialization was one of the elements that I looked at in space, uh, in state becoming. Uh, but for this purposes, I think this was the most interesting one. And I, because it brings to the fore the imaginary aspects of the state. And it also helps analyzing um, the imagined state and suspended or interrupted uh, state making processes, which also sharpens our eyes to the imagined uh, quality of every state, basically. Uh, and it, spatialization also helps make visible the becoming of the state, that this is a constant ongoing process that even established states such as uh, Sweden or Switzerland is about becoming, it's reproducing and constantly performing the state in order to become and to be a state. And I think it also sheds uh, light on the constitutive relationship between war making and state making, state breaking, but also on peacemaking and state making. So that was the, the fourth diagnostic site that I wanted to take you to. And I will end up with uh, discussing what is the value of the spatial term for peace and conflict studies, because I was pretty sure that that question would come up. So I'm uh, taking advantage of, of my time here to say what I think are the, the value or the added value of the, the, the spatial perspective. I think it draws attention to the spatial features of uh, the, uh, the spatial set of features that are at the center of war and peace, of peace building processes, of conflict dynamics, and so forth. And it also demonstrates that spatial theory provides analytical concepts useful to peace and conflict research. And we've found the concepts that we've used really helping us to dig deeper into and investigate the empirics of, of what we're interested in. And some of the recent spatial approaches to peace and conflict uh, studies also has helped question the very dichotomy between war and peace 
and demonstrated that the line between war and peace is very blurred. Um, and politics of peace building has also, and politics of belonging has also been foregrounded through a spatial perspective. And perhaps most importantly, I think um, the spatial turn and spatial perspective and spatial concepts and so forth help us raise new and critical questions in peace and conflict studies. And I think I used uh, almost all my time. And uh, I'm looking forward to the discussion and to hear your input. And I'm curious about your view, especially those of you who are geographers. There's so much we can learn from, from your research. And we have just started tapping into to this research. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Bergdahl, for this fascinating talk. Um, I'll hand over to Klaus Gleitai Kema now for the discussion, and then you can all already think about your questions. We'll have time for that later. Yeah, Annika, thank you very much So for this stimulating talk and for also for helping us think through what a spatial approach to thinking about peace could actually contribute to our work. So while well, you look at the where of both peacemaking and war making, but you really um, stressed in your talk uh, and you insisted on peacemaking, which I very much enjoyed because we, we often fall in this kind of trap that we in the end talk more about war than about peace. Um, because it is so much more visible um, in a way. And so, and at the same time in war, the importance of space is already, is already very much established as the famous quote of the French geographer and geopolitics expert Yves Lacoste demonstrates when he says, la guerre, uh, pardon, la géographie sert d'abord à faire la guerre. And so the, this quote can also be seen as a specific appeal to the discipline of ge geography, at least that's how I hear it, to also make peace intelligible. And so, as you mentioned, the spatial approach to peace really challenges also the rather linear way of representing peace, which is still common in political science. So peace as a political process, as a transition from a war to a peace situation. And according to this presentation, representation, peace is a matter of time. However, too many post-war cities, as you have also demonstrated, are still qualified several days, several decades later as being post-war. But until when does a city remain post? Um, and so in many of these cities, residents wouldn't qualify their situation as peace. And a recent example that we came across from a, a participant in the Bosnian city of Brečko said, when the shooting ended, it did not mean that the war stopped. And I think that like from all our different piece, uh, from all our different research uh, experiences, we can find similar examples. And so a spatial approach to peace is helpful for thinking about this blurred distinction between, this, between peace and war that you also mentioned. So during war, peace is being made in certain spaces as also the work of Nicole La Liberté in Northern Uganda demonstrates, for example. And after war, certain spaces continue to operate according to the war logic of separation, militarization, and hypermasculinity, as we can see in Northern Ireland, for example, or in the Balkans. But also terrorist violence blurs this distinction between war and peace. For example, when military operations are deployed within the borders of the nation states against the nation's own citizens, as has been the case of European cities that have been the targets of these attacks. And this is also something you look at in your research project on vulnerable cities that analyzes violence in cities such as Brussels and Paris within the same analytical framework as Jerusalem, Aleppo and Baghdad. And it is something that we were able to discuss about uh, just before and that I hope that we can pursue in, in this discussion of, of yeah, uh, how does also a spatial approach allow us to bring these kind of cities uh, in, in well-established democracies, as you say it, and, and uh, less established democracies, how can we bring them together in shared analytical frameworks? So peace and violence should not be thought of as binary or exclusionary categories, as you've also mentioned, that if one is present, the other is absent, but as being present at the same time and as being closed in space. So as a result, typically people create space for peace in contexts of violence 
and the two exist side by side in periods of war and afterwards. So peace is multiple, positive, and always in the making. It is made of the reproduction of positive social relations. So rather than describing the countries at war or at peace, you suggest to change the scale of our analysis to a sub-state level, that of the city, for example, in your important 2013 article on urban peace building. And so since peace building and conflict dynamics are productive of spaces in a material and symbolic sense, as you suggested in your talk, but also describe in much more detail in the book that you wrote with Suzanne Buckley's Distal of 2016, is there a spatial element to the experience of peace, is my question. Is peace particularly experienced in some spaces and not in others? And that is also a question that I've been asking myself about agonistic peace building, and if you use it in a spatial way, what does an agonistic space look like? Um, also in your work on war and peacecapes, don't we fall in the same kind of binary categories? Um, and I have been trying to use this analytically, but coming up with the difficulty, when can we qualify a space as a peacecape, since these are not like, since we shouldn't see these in such a binary categories. So um, I'm also interested at like a lot, but that is different for the examples and the diagnostic sites that you showed, which I'm less familiar with than your analysis of urban peace building, which really looks at the level of the city. And now you gave a good demonstration of, of how you can also look at these sites at a sub level level of the city. And so I was also wondering like, yeah, how um, if, if we look at the spatial approach, what does it look like at the level of the city, at a sub level of the city, and what can be the advantages and disadvantage of these different levels? What can they teach us? Well, thank you for, for brilliant comments and great insights. Uh, I should have talked a little bit more about the divided city and urban peace building, I feel now. <laughs> uh, but um, well, I think one of the things that um, that the urban peace building, um, the way I work with urban peace building and trying to rescale peace building to the urban level rather than to, as so we often do, is to think about it at the national level or we talk about global local. But I think the urban is an important site for peace building, especially when we talk about divided cities. Uh, and you know, post-war cities or post-conflict cities, because these are sites um, where perhaps the global and the local meet. So in a sense, that is a, an important site. But it also, I think, reflects the need to, to think about peace and to think about uh, conflict in, in a multi-scalar way, that we should incorporate more than the urban scale or, or the national scale and so forth in order to you know, grasp uh, the complexities of both conflict dynamics and, and peace dynamics. And I think Gerard Miller's work here on transscalar peace systems is quite fascinating uh, in bringing in the scalar approach to, to this in a much wider uh, sense that, than I did when I talked about rescaling peace building to, to the urban level. Um, and I mean, you're pointing at such a something that is so important and it's so hard to get around. So we try to unpack the binary uh, war and peace. And we think of peace as something more than the absence of war and peace and war can coexist. And as Foucault say, you know, peace is within war and war is within peace. And um, Robert, Roger McGinty claims that there is no war, no peace situations and we're always somewhere in between. Uh, and, and still, it's so easy to fall in the trap. And you, like I'm using warscapes and peacecapes as they were, as if they were spatially different and as they were, you know, side by side in a way, which is of course, you know, the same way as of thinking about war and peace as dichotomous. And that's not something I, I want to do, but it's easy to fall into that trap. And we have to be constantly aware of how we think about and how we use the concepts. Uh, and you're really pointing it out very clearly in, in your comments. And 
you brought up something that I need to think more about that I think is really fascinating, and that is uh, the spatial element of experiencing peace. So what does it mean to experience peace? I mean, is it something that is embodied? Is it something that is relational? Um, is it contextual? Is it outside body? Is it peace of mind? I mean, what, how, where do we place um, peace? And here, I think that the scale is interesting again, because we can think about the body as one point, one endpoint of, of scale, right? And then to, to the global. So perhaps peace can be experienced at different scales, um, depending on. But I need to think a little bit more about this. I think it's a really intriguing and fascinating question. And what is spatial about the experience of peace? I would like to think that it is something that has to do with relations uh, and that is some interrelational, but I need to think more about that. And yeah, I think I touched upon some of the most important aspects that you brought up and I'm happy to continue discussing them. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you.